his word is is still creating. You know, I was talking to a friend the other day whose son went to college, he joined a fraternity and just all kind of wrong attachments and heading in the wrong direction and all that stuff. And he, he attends church one Sunday and one phrase in God's word grabbed hold of that kid and he, in tears he called the fraternity and said, I'm dropping out today. And it, just a word of God created in him a new life. Well, what is it that you say to God when you're in his presence? And here's what those beings said. They said, uh, Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Today Count show. We're blessed that you would come back. We have started this uh, a, a whole different lane on our podcast, and I'm kind of, you know, calling it the Genesis Project where I'm going to be inviting various friends uh, of mine and maybe people I don't know that well uh, to the show to discuss the book of Genesis from the beginning to the end, all 50 chapters. Um, one of the things just to prepare you for, if this is the first podcast that you've listened to in regards to Genesis, we're not really preparing a presentation. Um, kind of in our imagination, uh, we are people that are meeting together for coffee. We have our Bibles open. We're, we're reading through the book of Genesis, and we're talking about it. Now, we have studied it. Uh, we've studied it a lot in our lives. And so we do think we have some things to share. But we also want to reserve the right to not always have to be so orthodox in every idea that comes to our mind because we're not trying to shield you from those kinds of ideas. However, if we do get a little bit off track, we will probably pull it back in and say, well, you know, I'm not sure how orthodox that is or, um, or, or whatever, but we do want to ha have a good, honest discussion. And I think it will be helpful for everybody. So we're in Genesis chapter one, and I'm going to be reading now the new living translation today, only because there's so much content and detail in these first 25 verses that as I read through them this morning, I read in the English Standard Version, which is a literal translation, meaning it's translated word for word from the Greek to English. When I say Greek, it's because though the Bible was originally, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, it was then translated into Greek and then Greek into English, which is you know what we call the Septuagint, which is what we're using today. So just to clarify that, and then the NLT, we, we call this an idiomatic translation, which, uh, you know, the idiom, right? Idiom, the, the common words that we use today. And so it's translated idea by idea or phrase by phrase, you know, that kind of, that kind of thinking. Um, so it's not a paraphrase. It is a translation, but it's not a word for word translation. I guess you can just say it's been translated in words and phrases in which we would commonly use today. All right, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, that, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees that grow seed bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produce plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the third day. Verse 14 now. 
Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also he also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and everything that scurries and swarms in the water. And every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said that the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Today on the show, we have uh, Gary Harps, who is a friend that I met through our, our podcast ministry, Pastor Winston Harris, who was with me last time, and Pastor Matt Martin, who was also with me last time. Welcome, gentlemen. Winston? I'm going to ask you to jump in. So what thoughts do you have after reading all those 25 verses of how this came to be? There's a lot going on in Genesis. There is a <laughs> lot happening in Genesis chapter one. Um, I kind of want to open it up for us. And, um, you know, as I was you know, studying um, something that I came across that, uh, to be honest, I hadn't come across before, but this idea of, you know, the gap theory, if you will, and, uh, you know, what what actually is happening between Genesis verse one and Genesis verse uh, two. And, you know, some believing that um, God maybe didn't create um, the earth formless and void. And so there's this theory out there, you know, more or less, you know, I'm going to paraphrase it, but um, that between Genesis one and Genesis two, um, Satan fell. And because Satan fell, essentially, um, you know, there's this kind of restart, if you will. And so, um, you know, as I think about that, uh, think about, you know, Genesis uh, chapter one, verse two, in, in, in my opinion, where I would lean towards, you know, is the fact that there is precedent throughout scripture that um, part of God's creation process uh, does, you know, include this potential that, uh, you know, he shapes and he forms. And so as I was reading this, I was led to Psalms 139, 16. Uh, where it talks about you've seen my formless substance, right? And this idea that even as humanity, humanity is uh, created or in, in this psalm, you know, as uh, the writer is talking about um, us being shaped, you know, and informed, we're, we're being formed, you know, almost from this uh, unshapen position and how that, you know, echoes to this original uh, creation process. Um, and, and, and this idea ultimately that, um, you know, potential, uh, in this in this verse, the potential for what God is about to create um, is chaos, is is chaotic. Whether we um, you know stretch it into our um, normal day to day life, where you know we 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 like to think about potential as a positive thing, but when when we're faced with the truth of potential, um, potential uh, needs order. Um, potential sounds good, but it is a, a, a nice way to say um, there's there's chaos. There's something that could happen here, but without uh, proper order, without proper hands on it, uh, it will never be seen, you know, to its full f fruition. Um, so even just getting stuck on verse two, um, you know, with this idea that uh, the earth was formless and void and the spirit is hovering over it and not until God's word goes forth, does order actually start to shape um, this, this potential, uh, this potential mass, or this potential substance, this a water ball, if you will, um, is an interesting, you know, idea. And, uh, you know, I, I find myself leaning towards uh, this idea that, you know, why wouldn't God create something that did not have shape or form? And he's going to walk us through and show us uh, not just in Genesis 1, but 
you know, throughout the narrative of scripture that God takes, you know, uh, formless things and he shapes it. And he, you know, even Jeremiah 18 talks about, you know, we are, we are the, the clay to, to him being the potter and, and, you know, those references of God and how he brings things to pass. And so, um, I find myself even just getting stuck on verse two in that concept. So any, any thoughts on, on the gap theory or what even happens between verse one and verse two from any of you guys? I believe, you know, obviously with the gap theory, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of potential to, to uh, maybe see a little bit of it, but there's a lot of holes that can be punched in that. And, and the fact that as we look at, you know, why would, why would God allow a space of time between Genesis one and one and versus Genesis one, verse two. And um, I've, I've never gone, I've never done a deep, deep study on it. Obviously I'm familiar with the gap theory, but um, to, you know, in all of my readings and understandings and working through this, um, you know, God, God created time. And as we get, we'll get into it, what a day is and what a day looks like. Um, and how, how we can, you know, in short, how would we get to, this gap theory, if we're going to follow the rest of scripture, the rest of the, the reading that you read today uh, in that. So, well, I'm, um, I guess I warn you, I, I uh, don't color in the lines and uh, you, you're, you're asking the question about the gap theory, but I don't really um, think it's the main question. Hmm. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, we all come at scripture with, with uh, whatever it is God has developed in us and our pers- in the learning we've already had. And, and so I'm, I'm wired a little more as an engineer. And so I'm not saying that's the right way to look at it. I'm just saying that's who I am and what God created me to do and be. And so when I look at these passages, I try to sort through uh, what is clear and say, what do I do with that? Uh, as opposed to what don't I know and I can't answer uh, because then it turns into a sort of a theoretical uh, dialogue. And I like doing those things. I really do. But um, I would just toss out something else that when we're reading Genesis 20, these first few chapters, as an engineer, I'm looking for two things. What was the creator's purpose? And then what was the purpose of the thing he created? Mm. And those are two different things. And I like to use an example of, I've got a stickly chair here. It's made third, fourth generation family business in New York. And I love that chair, but why did I buy it? And I I bought it as a keepsake because it's really well made. So there's, my purpose was to have a keepsake. It is really comfortable, and I spend a lot of time in it. Wrote two books sitting in that chair. And um, so that was my why. That chair is to sit in, and it is a hand-me-down. Well, if you ask the guy who created it why he created it, you'll get a different answer. And, I mean, you might he might say, well, I wanted to create a chair because, uh, I mean, I wanted you to sit in it, so there's some overlap there. But he wanted to provide for his family. And he wanted to express a gift, probably. I mean, he likes his work. He's a craftsman. And so when I look at Genesis, I'm, uh, that's, those are, that's the frame I use to say, what is this telling me about the creator? And then what are the design requirements for man, which he, I think are indicated in here? So I, I'm kind of going off on a different path a little bit. I don't tend to think about the gap theory. when I, I don't under, I, I've read about the gap theory. I don't know whether it's right or wrong. And so I I stopped thinking about it. Everybody, we're going to take a brief break from the Today Count show just to let you know that our very own Jim Piper has released a brand new book called Story, The Art of Learning from Your Past. And this is going to be for anyone who's looking to make a change in their life. If you feel stuck, if you want to grow beyond your current position, uh, man, we just believe there are stories and truths in this book that will help you move into the future with a different perspective. We all have a story and we can learn from that story to propel us into a strong future. Be sure to grab story 
where books are sold, Amazon and wherever you find books. All right, back to the podcast. Yeah, that's that's great. Hey, we're already off to a good start. <laughs> You know what what comes to what comes to my mind and I'll throw it back out to you guys is and is that you know as I was sitting reading it this morning again just kind of refreshing walking you know walking through the detail of it you know last time in our podcast we talked about the author the 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 human author uh, that we were pretty convinced that that would be Moses and and we kind of laid the groundwork for that and for those listening if you haven't heard that I think it's worth going back to the first and second podcast where we talk about it. But the thing that really hit me was, um, you know, we, all of us humans, we, we have to have some level of, of faith because this, this story that we're reading here is incredible. If you think about it, it's just absolutely incredible. And to, to Gary's point, you know, people are trying to find the meaning in life, but, you really can't find the meaning in life until you go back to the origin of, mm -hmm. of life. What is the origin of life? You know, that I would think just logically, you know, that that would, would come first. Uh, let's, let's speak to the gap theory though, so we could move on and let's define it a little bit for those listening. You know, when we read Genesis one, one, right, that's pretty clear. And that's why we had um, two 30 minute sessions just on Genesis one, one. But then it says, verse two, it says, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Some want us to believe that that mass there, what that glob, that Plato, whatever you want to call it, is eternal. And that, of course, is a problematic for us because we believe that there is only one uncaused cause and that being you know the lord mm -hmm. um so so if you you know obviously you can say okay well it doesn't necessarily mean that it could also just mean that god created the play-doh and then he began you know forming the play-doh which i think was to winston's you know point as mm -hmm. he you know here he here he, and and then you know i don't know if you i don't know if the two of you have listened to the podcast between gary and myself but I loved how he defined leadership. He and I remember this, Gary. And um, I I don't know if you were referring to Genesis uh, one one and two, uh, but you said that leadership could be. Uh, and I'm being a little loose in your definition, but leadership could be defined as uh, bringing order out of chaos. And uh, I I really I really like that. In fact. You know, I, I have I have a relationship with all three of you in, in different ways, and all three of you have given me phrases and stuff that that I kind of hide in my pocket. And over time, I might even believe that I'm the one who came up with it. We'll see what happens as yeah. you get older. You kind of forget <laughs> where where the source where the source comes from. But I want to read to you something that is from the book Paradise to to Prison, and I bought this at a garage sale many many years ago. But it's talking about uh, the scientific evidence um, for the the gap theory, and uh, and I don't think we have need to go into evolution and stuff because uh, you know I think that uh, for those listening, if they want to to do that, that's fine. I I don't. I mean, we'll do a little bit of a dive in it here and there, but not much. I mean, if the if the Earth is millions and millions of years old, frankly, we should just have more fossils than we have. Um, we should be able to see the mechanics of evolution in those fossils. You know, that is missing as well. Um, but let me read this to you. I, I think it's worth reading, guys. Um, furthermore, the prevailing scientific opinion is not without its problems. And this is speaking specifically of the gap theory. It argues that all forms of life evolved, but it has discovered no biological mechanism for evolution. This more than embarrasses the evolutionists. But the laws of thermodynamics make it rather doubtful that, va that vast increases in time really improve the probability of evolution by chance. Now, Gary, I'm putting you on the spot, but isn't, isn't the law of thermodynamics also, or a subset of it, also pointing to the fact that the, the, the um, universe is burning out? 
um, or or is it burn? Parts of it is burning out while it's also expanding. I, I forget exactly how well, that the goes. Es the essence of the law of thermodynamics is that uh, things return to an unordered state mm. unless you continue to put energy in it. So the ice cube in the freezer stays only stays frozen as long as the refrigerator is plugged in. And, um, and it's very related to chaos because, it, I mean, if you go back to the Genesis 1 account, God acted and there was some raw material. I don't know the time frames. And then he acted again and he brought order out of that material. Uh, and the, the science would tell us that that stuff won't stay ordered <laughs> unless the, something provides the energy to keep it ordered. So that's that's thermo law of thermodynamics. Okay. Um, and it says, um, then, too, if life existed on Earth for millions of years, there would be far more fossil evidence for it. And if all living forms evolved, the fossil record would include millions of transitory forms. Scientific opinion itself, therefore, is is uh, suspect. I just thought the book said it much better than, you know, than, than I did when I was um, – uh, moving through it. But we get to this other thing here, guys, in verse three, where it says, let there be light. And there was light. So we got we got light and we got darkness. But apparently we don't have sun and moon and stars. What do you make of that? It begs a question, doesn't it? I mean, it, it obviously makes you think there's some meaning here that isn't obvious. Because our view of light and darkness is very rooted in the sun and in the moon. And um, so it, I, I'm not saying what the answer is, but it does beg a question. It draws your attention. And, you know, and if you're if you're a believer or a seeker, Scripture has a way of pulling you in and makes it, you know, a, a lot of a, a lot of fun, I, I think, you know, because I don't. When you have a doubting heart, then all of a sudden you have fear, you know, pop up in your, you know, your heart and mind. You see, you know, you see holes. But if you if you have faith, then you lean in more and you, you know, you you desire to to learn more and, and figure, you know, some of this some of this stuff out. Matt, what are your thoughts? So as I dug into this and, and a lot of this, even going back to what we just talked about, you know, Hebrews 11 and 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed, formed at God's command. So what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And mm -hmm. so there's so much there that we could have mm -hmm. unpacked, uh, you know, kind of it goes back to what I was saying, shoot holes in that gap theory idea a little bit. But when we think about light, um, you know, I read, I read one writer some years ago and he said, you know, one of the first steps from chaos to order is to bring light. That's one of the fir first steps in order to, to, to dispel some of the chaos, let's bring some light to it. Uh, of course, we all know the, you know, the things we've said over the years, you know, you know, every, you know, you know, you got to bring it to the light, bring it to yeah. the light. And so, you know, that, I believe, I believe order has, is part of it here. The other is, and I am, I'm going to walk out to the very end of the limb that I'm standing on right now, and I'm going to find the smallest twig to stand on. I may be slipping and holding on to it, and y'all can pull me back because we're going to get to this, but the sun was, so we're talking about light, but no sun. Now, um, God is in the business of redemption. And God is in the business of bringing back to the original state. So a new heaven, a new earth, as we see in Revelation. And what does Revelation tell us? That there will be no need for the sun or the moon, for he will be the light that is, that, that is shining. So, I mean, I'm holding on to the end of the leaf right now, y'all. Y'all just, just hang with me, though. But is it that part of this is the reason that God wanted us to give us a glimpse, one, into order? bring light into your life. And there's spiritual connotation with that. Um, but also, you know, cause I think we said it last time, you know, God, God don't miss a trick in the Bible. Like there, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing lacking there. Uh, but could it be that the original order as he set it in place, um, as he's beginning his creation was yes to bring light to, to, you know, to start forming out of the chaos and bring, and bring it, bring order to that. But also, 
that there is a, there was a day because we have to go back to, you know, who he, he was, he is, and he is to come. The, the unchanging attributes of God. There was a day he was the light and there will be a day again where he is just the light. The sun and the moon, what do we, what do we use that for? And it's, it's, it's so that we can, we can, we can use it as a marker, a play, mm -hmm. a way to measure time, a way to measure direction. Um, and so, yes, it's once, you know, it's called the great light and the lesser light as, as we'll unpack here in a little bit, but um, way out on the end of the limb, that's, that's the best I think I have for you, Jim, because there's not a whole lot out there about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I like, Matt, how you use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And I mm -hmm. think that is, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that we could share with the listeners now. If you're a believer or a seeker and you have a high view of Scripture, meaning that you, you're, you're tempted to believe what Christians say, that that this this Bible of ours is... is uh, a very unique creation. It is uh, written by man's hands, but inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Speaking of God, since this is all about God, uh, it's also hard to ignore that we have, you know, the masculine plural Elohim uh, in, for, for the name of God in, in verse 1, but now we see the Spirit of God in verse 2 hovering. And then, of course, you know, which we haven't got to yet, but in our next podcast together, you know, we'll be looking at that infamous statement, uh, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And, I, you know, while you were talking, Matt, and listening, I was listening to you do your scripture, interpreting scripture, I, I couldn't help but turn to Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 16, says, for by him referring to Christ. Um, all things were created. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why we use scripture to interpret scripture. It helps us fill it, right? And, and we don't have time to go through all of it, but read just a couple more phrases. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things. I think one of you said it at our last pat podcast that if you can if you can accept Genesis 1 1 you're going to do pretty well getting through the rest of the Bible <laughs> and it's it's you know I mean there it is right there it is okay yeah, what are some can, what are some hanging thoughts Winston you've got you're ready to go yeah if I can kind of piggyback off of you know uh, Matt's um, twig or branch if you will <laughs> there is a narrative once again that's trying to be introduced um, and if this is Moses writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, then not only are we seeing, you know, the genesis of creation, but we're also getting, you know, our own, you know, introduction to who God is. And so you now now he's introducing this narrative of himself as as a light, if you will, because there's no other source, you know, of light here. We're left to believe that the only thing that could be generating this light is God himself. And now, you know, we're we're starting to draw these parallels going forward throughout the rest of scripture that we'll continually see over and over. And so this is almost, you know, God, you know, subtly introducing himself um, to us in a way that he's going to continue to reveal himself throughout scripture as light. But, um, you know, I, I'm a, I love Psalms 139. I think I already referenced, you know, a, a portion of it previously, but I came across this also Psalms 139 and 12 that says, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you, which is an interesting statement, you know, because God is the one here who is separating light from darkness. So darkness does exist. But once again, it's almost like God is showing himself to us in Genesis one, not only that he is light, but he has supremacy over darkness, right? Like he, he is able to separate, he is able to distinguish, and he is able to um, kind of initiate, if you will, be a catalyst in this creation process um, to, to create time and, and distinguish between darkness and light. But it's not like darkness was some concept or some, you know, uh, construction that, you know, God was like, okay, what do we do with this darkness? No, it was more like, okay, I'm going to, I'm in control of it ultimately. 
And then once we get back to the spiritual implications of that, right, you know, there's no way darkness ever overcomes light. And so all of these threads are kind of being presented to us. Um, and, you know, the rest of scripture, you know, obviously touches on these things and, and um, God uses these things to encourage us. But I just think that's interesting there, right? Once again, there's no other way to explain why there is light other than the supernatural um, production of light that has to come from God. You know, Jim, I, <clears throat> kind of in framing how we even think about this stuff, um, you, there's a passage in, um, I think it's Second Corinthians, maybe I, maybe one of you pastors, I'm not a pastor, would remember. But it, it's the essence that when we um, cause someone to stumble in their conscience, mm. that we're actually sinning against Christ. And it's it's an amazing passage, and it's talking about things that I should have freedom on, like what I eat. And but it, he goes to say that hey, if I use my freedom in a way that uh, damages somebody else's conscience, then I've actually sinned against Christ. Now, the reason I bring that up is some of the things I say. I want to say to your listeners that um, I respect that. I want to respect your conscience and this 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 the seven day creation those things are things that are deeply held by some people and it can wound them <laughs> to suggest that there's another way mm. but what I hold at a high standard uh, using bi the biblical truth to interpret biblical truth is that God says he, the heavens themselves reveal his glory and so I find that studying science actually helps me inform how I interpret scripture and vice versa. And in the end, there will, I'm not afraid of those conflicts because in the end, God is the source of both. And the only miss, only conflict is in me. It is not in him. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> I, you know, there's so much we do not know about, like you guys talking about light. Well, what does it even mean? Well, you know, we only see 2% of the light spectrum. Our eyes only grasp 2%. And uh, quantum theory tells us that we don't know whether light's a wave or a particle. And in fact, it's both at the same time. God is a God of contradictions. In my mind, it can't be both at the same time. But in God's realm, it can be. And so I've gotten more comfortable over the years saying there are things I don't know and understand, and it does not diminish my my belief in God. It increases my my understanding that he is beyond me. So um, I don't understand this issue of why the sun and the moon are not really highlighted until the fourth um, day. It's a, it's a mystery, but I, I accept it. I find it interesting as, you know, as we read through this that light didn't banish darkness because the very, very next phrase says he separated the light from the darkness and he hmm. called the light day and the darkness he called night. Hmm. And so it, this is in, you know, because we want to think that because, again, you know, Gary, you said it best. We, we have such limited, you know, even what we have a limited understanding of what light even is. Yeah, you know, that's we, right. Yeah. I just can't even agree on what so it is. When we, think, when we think of light, we think it completely obliterated darkness because that's what it does in our world. Mm -hmm. like it, but, but in reality, I mean, this is so much bigger than us mm -hmm. when we think in terms of the universe, is that light, again, a lot of scriptural narrative here, light being po more powerful than darkness, light pushing darkness back and saying, Darkness, you're only allowed to a certain point. Um, so I do believe the quality and the character qualities and the characteristics of God are shown here in that even in the life of the believer, that as being filled with him, I'm filled with the light of life and the light of God in my life. Mm -hmm. And darkness can't come back and overtake me. So again, I'm pulling some some spiritual parallels here, but I did find it interesting because in our mm -hmm. in our in our mind, because when he spoke it, it happened. According Amen. to scripture, it was there wasn't this dawning of light; it was light that mm. hit. 
And so, so that light immediately pushed darkness back to somewhere. And so, anyway, just. You know, I heard a rabbi teach one time. They, you know, they have such respect for the, yes. the, um, these words that they're divine. And uh, they, they were just talking about this cycle of why did God repeat from dark to light, morning to evening? You know, and it, it, it restates God's dominion like you're talking about. Yeah. It's just reminding us, I come up and I take over darkness that's over that. and over. Okay. And that's what we're called to do ourselves, right? Walk in the light and put, put to death the deeds of the darkness. So anyway. Yeah, to, to kind of Gary got us started off on the, you know, the, the humility of, you know, being, recognizing the the people around us. And ultimately, you know, what we're talking about here is not just uh, God, but his, his plan for us and uh, his purpose uh, for us. And that's the ultimate thing that, that we're striving for. Mm -hmm. And that in that pursuit, sometimes we might disagree on where we're at, uh, at any juncture, you know, along, along the way. But I think that's a whole, I think that's a whole reason why we're doing this Genesis project is, is discussion, right? There's no sermon being preached here. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no altar call. Um, you know, this, this is a, this is, uh, let me, let me read this to you. Psalm 111, two says, great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. <laughs> Studied by all who delight in them. You know what that that tells me is that, and I and I read this the other day too. So it's this the coining this phrase is not original with me. But uh, if I'm a if, if I'm somebody at, at this juncture in life and I call myself an atheist, it doesn't make me any a better or a worse scientist as long as my pursuit is is honest. If I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make my pursuit of a science uh, of science any any better. It's almost like this verse is inviting all to come, all to study, all to pursue. And for those who do fear that we might run into some contradictions, fear not, um, because if there if there is a contra if there is an apparent contradiction from scripture to uh, science. So far, we really haven't found anything that's not that difficult to explain in the sense of, well, that isn't a fact yet. Or, or maybe, the, maybe you're reading something in your Bible that the Bible didn't mean to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, we can, we can do that. But don't you love that, that scripture? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, this is a little devotional moment. <laughs> I, I, I've always wanted to have a long life. Uh, that's just an honest confession. I'm 64 years old, and ever since I turned 40, it's been a bit of a challenge. Um, I've run into health issues. I've run into physical you know, mm -hmm. issues. Uh, both of my shoulders have been replaced now. And doggone it, a, a little more than a week ago, I, I fall. <laughs> I trip going upstairs just four weeks after a major surgery. My hands are full and I land on my right rib cage. And so then you're in pain medication. You can't move around well. You get exhausted, you know, by 11 a.m. And, and um, it, you, you can't help. I think most humans, you can't help where what begins to happen I think in God's gentleness and kindness is that I don't have to live in this body forever because it's, it's, it's running out of steam, but you know what it is doing? It is increasing my curiosity mm -hmm. as to when I do pass, what is that going to look like? I know it's going to involve energy. Do, how do I know that? I don't know that, but everything in me says it involves energy in a way that is, I mean, that to me is amazing. And I'm looking at this creation account and we haven't even gotten to the part yet where God makes us as human beings. 
Um, but that's going to be a fascinating podcast that we're going to we're going to get to, and that that one might be a lot like Genesis one one, where we have to dedicate a lot of time mm -hmm. just to talking about <laughs> the image and likeness of God and God's you know design and and purpose for these things called called human beings. But I can honestly say that you know though I want to see my grandkids grow up. And though I want to see some of these, you know, things, I want to see the Tigers win the World Series again. I want to see the Lions win a Super Bowl. Oh, easy, easy. <laughs> You're pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Gary lives in, in enemy territory in Ohio. So yeah. uh, don't, he, don't he want to get into that as a Wolverine? Indians. No, so, let's not uh, talk about the Indians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I find as, as I get older, I honestly – you know, um, I, I find that those books in my library that I've had since I was in my 20s that didn't really appeal to me that much at that time begin to appeal to me more. Billy Graham's book on angels, uh, the, you know, various books on heaven and, uh, you know, those kinds of things become very interesting uh, to me. Uh, and and of course, these things that we're talking about um, are important to me as well. Anyway, that was just something that I wanted to want, want, wanted to share. What are some other thoughts that have come to you guys as reading through and studying through this, um, not quite through the first chapter of Genesis? I forget what his, what his actual title is. Gerald uh, Schrader, have any of you heard of him? He's a, he's a um, physicist or something that he, <clears throat> I think retired now, but he, he, uh, taught at the University of Jerusalem, someplace over there. And um, I, I'm not saying what he's saying is true. What I'm, what I'm saying is the variety of ways that God could have done this <laughs> is astounding. And he's, he makes the big link between God being light. You know, God has revealed himself as light, he says. And light is the only thing in the universe that is constant. It, it's, it has properties that are different than any other physical thing in the universe. Its speed is the same regardless of whether, you know, you throw a baseball out of a 50-mile-an-hour car and the baseball is going 70 miles an hour because you threw it at 20. But if you shine your flashlight out, it doesn't change the speed at all. It's bizarre. And uh, so when you think about God being constant and unchanging, there's this little symbolism. Well, he goes on to point out that, as you approach the speed of light, uh, time, the, the, the way you perceive time changes. The guy traveling at that. And he said, so who, what perspective is this written from? Genesis. Who's the observer? Is it God himself or is it somebody on earth? And he, he goes through the, all this argument to say, you know, it could be several literal days on earth and billions of years from God the observer, because time is relative to the observer. I'm not arguing that that's true. I'm just saying, whoa, there's a lot I don't know. <laughs> you know, and here's a scientist who's explaining how you could reconcile the laws of physics with two different interpretations of the time. Yeah, and I think where we can agree as humans is, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I could I could quote you an Exodus passage where I think it uh, I forget chapter and verse, but you know it's at my fingertips here. Where just before the Ten Commandments are uh, re, re, uh, explained, uh, it's prefaced with God created the heavens and earth in in seven Six, you know in seven, seven, yeah seven I days that. Mm -hmm. right right mm -hmm. and and there's and then and there's there's all kinds of other references to that, but that does not necessarily um, mean. Uh, that they're all green, agreeing to what what it means. I think it's a bit of a leap, though. I, I will say, I will say this, you know. Uh, so, you know, right from the beginning in verse two, and I quote: "It says, then God said, then God said." And and if we don't think through this, we kind of forget that the Bible teaches us that God is spirit. And so, when it says God said, well, I don't know about you guys, but when when I think of God speaking, I'm seeing a voice box. I'm seeing a a a mouth. I'm seeing a a tongue. 
And so is this metaphoric? I, I mean, I think the answer is yes and no. I, I think it's he spoke, so it's literal. But did he spake with the way that that I do? I I I don't think so. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't I don't think so. It's like if you guys said, man, Jim flew through the building today. Well, did I have wings and fly through the building today? Or did I not say hi to anybody and just grab what I needed to grab and, and got out of, you know, got out of there. But then again, I come back to what was the intent of the author? What did the readers assume to be correct? Um, and, you know, when you think about when this was probably written um, or at least gathered together, we talked about this a little bit last time, as they're wandering in the wilderness what had they already experienced? Well, Moses would have already experienced the talking, burning bush. They've already been led by a cloud and a, you know, and a pillar. Um, they've, so they have seen God speak in, in, in certain, certain ways, but not in this way, right? This is, this is a different way. So to Gary's point, we sometimes, if we get too philosophical, then we get off track. But if we also are too rigid, mm -hmm. then, you know, we're not using our brains enough and we're lock we're locking God into this little tight human box. <laughs> I read this the other day. If you go to Exodus chapter 19, and this is Moses going to Mount Sinai uh, right before the Ten Commandments. But and it's, just, it's a back and forth between he and God. And so God would speak to Moses and he would say, go tell the people. And then, you know, it, you know, he had this God experience and then he said, I'll tell you what to say. But I want to, I, I noticed this while I was reading it and it ties into what you were saying in verse, um, let's see here, uh, verse, verse seven. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And um, so the people responded, we'll do everything the Lord said. So Moses brought their answers back to the Lord. Just back and forth. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their, their trust in you. Then mm -hmm. Moses told the Lord what the people said. And so, you know, it's interesting that God was, so let's go to Moses being the writer. So let's, you know, Gary, you've brought this up so well as through his lens. And Miss, I think you said it, you know, kind of, through how Moses is seeing this, but there's an instance where Moses and God are talking. So he knows what it sounds like. <laughs> and God said, well, hold up. I'm not sure the people do. So I'm going to let them hear me talk to you now. And so, you know, so when we go back to, and God said, you know, again, there's it's a fascinating. It's yeah. Fascinating. It's really fascinating. It, so. it really, I mean, you know, forget the silly human stuff. Like, you know, there are Chinese believers who hear God in Chinese. You know, and <laughs> they have to, right? And <laughs> and if I heard God speak in Chinese, I wouldn't think God spoke. <laughs> That's good. But to your point of God speaking with a voice box, you know, was it just you know word words? What 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 did that actually look like? My mind goes to, you know, John 1, which we talked about last time as well. You know, the Word was God. The Word was with God. The Word became flesh, right? And so there implicitly, once again, in God speaking, you know, the presence of Jesus or the reality of Jesus in, in, in the Trinity and in, in God, three in one, Elohim, all of these um, realities of who God is in, implicit in God speaking. And, you know, obviously there, there's a lot to try to sift through there, but just the simple idea that um, God speaking isn't just God speaking. There's a lot more obviously happening than we can comprehend. Mm. You know, this should be, this should be opening up all of our spirits to, you know, relook at Genesis again and get lost in the wonder of our God. Should it not? Yeah. Uh, no question. I <clears throat> Winston's comments made me realize that there's a, the dimensions of his speaking are 
we we understand so little but see it's almost like there is another creation every time his, this truth is repeated repeated there's something formed in me that's new you know so his word is is still creating you know i was talking to a friend the other day whose son went to college he joined a fraternity and just all kind of wrong attachments and heading in the wrong direction and all that stuff and he he attends church one Sunday and one phrase in God's word grabbed hold of that kid and in tears he called the fraternity and said, I'm dropping out today. And it, just a word of God created in him a new life. I mean, it's, hmm. it's astounding. And so uh, when we read Genesis, there's the historical view of what is happening. And then there's the, what is happening in me when I read this? <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's been different points and times in my life where I have not heard God audibly, but the impression upon my whole being was undeniable to where it changed the course of my life. Amen. And and uh, where I could not, you know, uh, push push it away. Again, I'm. I mean, you already pointed this out. I, you know, I like to follow this through Scripture. So we we, you know, if you would, the mouth, the voice box of God speaking in Genesis one. And again, it's he he was, he is, and he is to come. So th there's there's so much about that. John chapter one. Man, we could we could do twelve podcasts just on that <laughs> one chapter. You know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Um, but then and I I mentioned this to Winston earlier, you go to Revelation chapter 19, and it, it begins to describe Jesus again it, it, as the mighty warrior now taking dominion over everything and it says coming out of his mouth is a sharp sharp sword with which to strike down the nations again that strong the strong words for the word of god that did uh, revelation 19 unpacks all of this but we see the power of the words but more importantly we see the power of the word of god again setting up his characteristics his quality and his character of who he is throughout the whole scripture and I believe there's a part of, in order for it to be congruent, Genesis 1 had to say, and God said, in order for Revelation 19 to hold the power of, of, of the word that will come out of his mouth again. Because if, this, if, the, same, if the same voice box, you, if you would, because we, we, can, we can draw the line, if, if the same voice box said, let there be, and it was done, then when I get to Revelation 19 and there's going to be power and there's going to be victory and 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 the world is going to be created into or recreated into what it should be and renewed, I should say, into what it's going to be, then then Revelation 19 will stand on Genesis chapter one because of the power uh, of the word. If you look at uh, the latter part of the section that we read today, uh, you'll be reminded that uh, God is describing creating mature uh, beings, mature animals, and mature trees. I have that wrote down. It's funny you say that. <laughs> as well as the ability to re reproduce. Now, I don't know that the Bible says it exactly, but I almost see that as a typology of Christ in this way, because in my philosophy, um, when we see Christ, we will see him in human form, uh, a glorified yes. human form, something, something similar to us, but not us, because we're not that yet. Or maybe when we see him, we will be that, right? And, and to me, I think about the wonder of God. So when he set out here in the book of Genesis to create, not only did he know because of, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, we, we, we use words like holy and we use words like sin that separates and they're so low level words, right? They're, they're, they're kindergarten words in my mind to describe this, this chasm between, between God and, and the fallen human so before God even, this is my thinking, before God even created, he knew he would become incarnate. He would, he would take on flesh and he would be in that form for eternity. Hmm. 
for what reason? It couldn't be as good as his previous condition, could it? I don't know the answer to that, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking to myself, that is a crazy, that's a crazy story. It's a, it's an absolute crazy story. I don't even know what to do with it. And, you know, it's like if I get to talk to him one-on-one -on -one, and, and of course I'm limiting, you know, to, to Gary's word, which is a key word, I think in this discussion dimension, uh, you know, Dr. Hugh Ross, when he came to my church in California, many, many, many years ago, um, he, one of the things that he explained to us was a, a, a lot of things that we can't understand. Remember when Jesus said, you know, if you guys can't understand this, you can't even understand, <laughs> right? And when, when, when Hugh Ross pulled that out of scripture, he says what Jesus was talking about, he believed was that, that, you know, God hasn't given us the dimension or dimensions that, that we need yet, you know, to, to, to be in, in this other state. And uh, I, you know, I, I found that to be fascinating. And that's why I, I too kind of lean towards that whole energy dimension science thing, which it isn't separate from scripture. You know, one is, this is about as dumbed down as I can do for, for you guys. <laughs> what do you, what are you going to, to do with that? But just the whole idea of creation where he creates both the maturity of things and the ability to reproduce at the same time is fascinating to me, especially when I think about Christ, the incarnate Christ. And um, he was resurrected and he ascended, as far as I know, in the same glorified body um, that he got at the resurrection. And why would he be in a different form? He's the firstborn um, of creation. And we follow him, right? And that, that's what the Bible teaches. Now that is, that's a mind blower. And so I ask, I guess maybe it's the same, maybe I'm repeating the same question, but in uh, Re Revelation 4, there's a scene where we see God on the throne and everyone's gathered around him. And I, I find it interesting to say, well, what is it that you say to God when you're in his presence? And, and here's what those beings said. They said, uh, um, holy, 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 of course. And then, then it says, by your will, all things exist. I mean, you talk about, think about that. That means your existence flows out. Me, me, Gary Harps, with all my warts, flaws, <laughs> I'm here because the omnipotent God wanted me to be here. That is, and I'm just building on what you were saying, the why question. Why would he, anyone do that? Why would an infinite God create me? <laughs> yeah, and to jump off of that, you know, uh, Jim, you introduced Colossians 1, uh, and I'd been recently just kind of hanging out in there and, you know, kind of trying to get some context, cultural, social, you know, um, of what was happening in Colossae. And, you know, Paul is writing to this church that's trying to come back, you know, a lot of things uh, socially and culturally um, to help them understand the supremacy of Christ. And, you know, I, I think when we're looking at Genesis not only is it, you know, the, the creation account or an opportunity to kind of understand how, you know, things came to be, uh, but it can also be a, a great framework, you know, to understand the gospel because, um, you know, Paul is trying to help them understand, uh, you know, to your point, Gary, and, and all that we're, we're talking about, but the, this reality that there is nothing that supersedes Christ. There's nothing that supersedes Amen. God. The, the church in Colossae, they're, you know, wrestling with Jewish mysticism and, and all these other things that were trying to explain power and, you know, the ability to, to, to navigate life, if you will. And Paul was like, there is nothing more supreme than, than Christ. And then, then it gets into, you know, Christ is before all things. And the statement that, you know, I come back to often, um, all things hold together in Christ. So literally mm. the fabric of all creation is being suspended by the power of Christ. And then we get back to Genesis, which is the word, you know, goes forth. And then we tie back into John 1 again. 
the word, you know, was God, the word was with God, the word became flesh. So this, this hermeneutical, you know, uh, triangle, if you will, that reinforces, you know, the supremacy of God and why Genesis is so important. If we, if we don't grapple with Genesis, we, we can't really grapple with the gospel. Pretty good discussion, guys. Um, unless you have a, another thing to jump off on, uh, we have discussed Genesis 1, 1 to verse 25. And next time we get to finish, <laughs> maybe, uh, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, where it, begin, where it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And it goes on to a more purposeful description of of our existence and a few verses later that will take us to the end of uh chapter one but that will be doubtful that we could get through those few verses in one hour um so i know you're going to be ready for that and i hope that all three of you could join me for that one particular because uh, I would just love to play referee and watch you guys go at it uh, with with that one. Winston, Matt, Gary, thanks for joining me today uh, on uh, this Genesis Project. 